we are going to be talking about river futures and the relationship between people and rivers through a number of different ways of looking at that, um, at that question of how we relate to rivers. And so we're going to be leading off with Lydia. Um, I'm just going to very briefly um, give you a bit of an indication of Lydia's fantastic background. So she's going to be talking to us today about flood adaptation in a time of climate extremes. And as I said, Lydia is currently a PhD candidate at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and she specialises in environmental policy planning for extreme weather events and climate adaptation. Lydia has an extraordinarily rich background as well. Um, we're going to be hearing from Cyril in the second half of today about uh, legal rights of rivers. Um, Lydia has also worked into that space as well. So there's an enormous amount of crossover between our speakers um, in, in their different presentations. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lydia to get us started. Perfect. Thank you so much, Erin, uh, and to Creel for hosting us today um, and for this opportunity. Uh, just so that I don't bore you too much, I'm going to keep track of my time. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here. Um, yeah. So today I'm going to talk about um, research that is trying to disentangle um, how do we look into the effects um, of, a pol of policies that are intending to reduce flood losses um, by not only considering whether they, do they work or not uh, in reducing flood losses, but also who is benefiting from that reduction. Um, <clears throat> so the way um, I do this in this case is um, by evaluating a policy in, in the US um, that is called the community rating system. So this, um, this policy encourages, um, there is the first one from the 1990s actually that has encouraged communities to get involved in the planning uh, for flood adaptation and flood management, um, engaging, um, mostly local government stakeholders, but also some members of the community. And uh, it the, the program proposes a series of activities that are um, supposed to be um, activities of reference in terms of flood management. So what are kind of a state of the art uh, things that you would do in your town to reduce flood losses? What you see here in this map um, is you see orange dots and blue dots. So there is this um, data set that kind of brings about a kind of a quasi experimental setup. That is what we exploit in order to get a, gain a better understanding of what's going on. Um, so here you have uh, the representation of um, flood uh, claims that have been paid. So after there is a flood event, there is um, insurance flood claims are made, and then there is an assessment of whether there have to be paid or not. So the ones in orange are uh, places that have participated in the community rating system program. The ones in blue have not. However, they have access to the same type of um, flood insurance payments uh, because this is the national flood insurance. Um, program and so just by um a, by doing very basic um regulatory um preparations i guess in at the local level you can also access this so um very very briefly what we try to do in this kind of uh, quasi experimental setup is to calculate the conditional average treatment effect of this community rating system program. And basically um, what, what we try to do is to understand what is the difference, what will be the difference between um, a place and its counterfactual in whether, uh, whether they implemented this flood implementation, uh, flood, sorry, um, prevention, prevention measures or flood management measures or not. Um, the way we do that is using, uh, a degenerative models, which everyone knows about these days, is like ChatGTPs, like DALI, and in particular, this technique uh, called neural density estimators with normalizing flows. Um, and what we use as the outcome is the total insurance claims per policy. Um, and I want to say upfront 
that this is not uh, re reflective of all the damages that, that occur after flooding. Uh, obviously, beyond infrastructure and beyond the contents of a building, there is many other ripple effects that occur during flooding. Um, however, it is, um, it is something that we can measure. And many other of these impacts are so far invisible in terms of numbers. Um, and it's also an important impact for communities because this is their house, this is their home, and this is the contents of their home. So it's not non-negligible. So um, uh, yeah. And I won't go into much uh, more detail just to explain very, very basically the this is this is kind of how it works, where you um, basically have the expected uh, conditional probability distribution of the treated versus the non-treated given a particular covariate of interest. In this case, we're gonna be talking about um, covariates such as education, such as income, et cetera, uh, as we explore the results. Um, and the most interesting part of this uh, methodology is that it allows us to move away from traditional OLS approaches or um, logistic regression approaches where you have a predefined idea in the model of what is the relationship between, uh, in this case, our outcome of interest, so these flood payments and um, the covariance of interest. Um, this is a non-parametric model. So it, it, we will not get the information of, you know, there is a trend upwards. So more precipitation, more flood losses, but rather we might find, a, you know, like, um, at the beginning of precipitation, there is a lot of losses, then little losses, then again, more losses. And that is what allows us to have a more detailed understanding of what's going on for different types of community profiles and different people. Um, so this is uh, kind of how the results could look like. This is bidimensionally, but imagine that each covariate has a ma many multiple dimensions. So you would see like, um, you know, like a bunch of dots in a cloud, I would say. Um, but for instance, like let's take as an example, precipitation um, as a function of diversity. And you can already see, I don't know if can I step out or then people can't hear me. All right, let's go. Uh, so here you can see, for instance, that uh, you have precipitation as a function of diversity, and this is the treatment effect. So um, red means that by applying the treatment, you're actually reducing flood losses. Blue means that is increasing. So here you can see that there is an initial reduction, but then as precipitation goes up and diversity goes up, there is kind of like a decrease in effect. And then again, an increase in effect. These are the type of things that you can, um, the type of nuances that you can get to with this methodology. And why we think that is interesting, not only for this policy in particular, but it could be interesting in general as a way of evaluating the implementation of other policies in the future. So um, in order to kind of structure some of the findings, um, uh, we look into different profiles of uh, communities or populations, in this case at the zip code level, by focusing on a, a population number, income, and diversity. And so by exponentiating this, you get 27 typologies of uh, communities. And, you know, this is, these are some of the results. I really do not recommend to do this at home. This is a terrible way of showing results in a presentation. Um, but I just wanted to show this slide to kind of portray, you know, the complexity or the nuance that you can get by using this type of um, uh, a methodology. And this is only a way in which we're slicing the data, but it could be into many other ways. So depending on what is your question and what is important to evaluate, uh, we can we can tweak this. So I'm just gonna go through. Some of the main results, um, there is many more we can discuss later if anyone is interested, um, but some highlights, I guess. Um, so 
overall in this image, you can already see right away one thing, and it's that the blue is kind of floating on the top and the orange is kind of on the bottom. So um, this uh, shows that claims or flood claims um, decrease the most when applying the treatment in highly populated communities, while uh, claims tend to increase particularly in low population, diverse and poor communities. Um, we also see a trend regarding precipitation. And in this case, precipitation means how much it rained on average in the month of loss. So it's not in general how much it rains in a place, but actually how much it rained in that month. And this is important because um, this, uh, this is um, a main contributor to what could be the effect of a flooding. Um, so we see this general trend going down um, where we actually see the treatment working better uh, for uh, instances where there has been higher precipitation. So the, so it actually works implementing this type of activities. Although uh, we see some, um, you know, um, outliers out there. And, and particularly we see that actually while everyone else is going, everything else is going down, we see that claims increase with precipitation and these orange lines represent diverse, uh, rich and populous communities. Now, when we look at the type of places that uh, correspond to these oran orange lines into a map, it um, overlaps perfectly with big cities. And, you know, there is already an extensive body of literature showing that um, a places like big cities have the most amount of impervious surfaces and these are great contributors to flooding and in the um for the purposes of this um research what it is telling us is that it's not just a matter of prescribing a set of ideal activities where places get to decide what um, activities they implement or not but rather in this in the case of big cities um if you have too much impervious surfaces in this case it doesn't matter or it won't matter as much if you're implementing other measures if if it rains a lot that month then you won't you will not be able to um uh, to to respond to to flooding appropriately um then in terms of uh looking at education we also find an interesting trend which is that you can see the claims decreasing um overall but this trend it only holds until the 40 percent mark of educational attainment after which we see an uptick um now we actually expected to to find um an a potential increase in the overall uh, with the overall treatment effect because the program in itself has actually an educational component where people get to learn or citizens get access to learn how the process of filing these claims work. But um, but we like this would be in principle, uh, these sessions happen everywhere. So the effects should be the same at any education level. But we are seeing here that actually maybe these sessions are more accessible, the more educated you are, and they should be uh, maybe um, change in the way they are organized or the way um, stakeholders get to participate. Um, and we also um, see that claims, uh, like we saw initially, we also see that claims increase overall for a diverse poor low population. We see these blue lines uh, and the thick ones, particularly up, up there in, Initially, we saw them in all of um, in for all of the covariates, and um, again, um, when you are kind of trying to understand what is the effect of a program, you might either see that there is no effect whatsoever, um, or you might see that there is an effect in decreasing. But there is not a lot of reasons to think a priori that implementing flood management activities is gonna make your flood losses go up. Um, so here uh, there is certain literature that has already shown that in the US, um, there is certain types of population 
mostly diverse, poor and low income communities that have been disproportionately always underpaid after uh, there is a flood event. And um, our hypothesis here is actually that the, the implementation of this program, of these educational sessions, uh, of this inf um, adding this information and making it available to the communities, actually um, allowing for them to recover some of that money. So they basically, without the treatment, they were being underpaid for their losses. Um, okay, I'm going to skip in the interest of time some um, some of the findings. I think this one, uh, I'm gonna stop for this one um, just because I, I think that is interesting uh, in the context of uh, law school and is the issue of diversity. So we find for every every covariate, we find this, ten, this trend constantly and it is that there is a consistent gap uh, within low income uh, where the program works or is more effective for uh, low diverse communities. Uh, than those that are more diverse. And um, this, this is interesting in itself because we can be happy that the program is working for low-income communities, but again, we, we see this kind of dichotomy between those that are being more benefit and less, even within the low-income uh, bracket. There is some research that has associated that some types of... Um, Blood management activities that are associated with uh, with actually race in the U.S. So uh, less diverse communities tend to implement um, activities such as sea walls, while more diverse communities may have um, a activities or flood management activities that are more geared towards, for instance, relocation. And this is not necessarily a matter of free choice. They sometimes it will mean that they are tapping onto the type of resources that they have and they are making the choices depending on what are the uh, tools that they have available and also what are the type of recommendations that they are receiving from governments to, to do certain things. Uh, so, so it's also important to kind of take those in consideration. Um, and uh, one, uh, also another interesting, and the last thing that I will say about the results is that even though we see this gap uh, in uh, when when it comes to flood risk, again, I'm bringing this with me. Uh, so here you see it as a function of flood risk and you see how the gap, even though it was continuous everywhere, here it decreases as the risk increases. Um, and there is, um, now an increasing, I guess, um, a field of inquiry into looking into what are the contributions that uh, more diverse communities may have into the resiliency of their own community. And this may be a signal that is showing that uh, this uh, kind of gap is closed because of the capacity of the community resp to respond better despite of um, the differences. But of course, this is just showing kind of a trend. And then from there, you have to actually dig in and see what's going on. Um, so just closing remarks or some conclusions that we've reached after seeing these results is that this is state of the art uh, flood management interventions do decrease uh, flood losses. The decrease or the effectiveness varies a lot depending on the typology of community. Um, uh, this in itself is reason enough to rethink the way we uh, think about accessing um, affordable flood insurance. So in the case of this program, communities that participate in these activities um, receive a discount in their flood insurance. So many of them will be implementing the activities that they are recommended because they, in that way, their constituents can access uh, more affo affordable flood insurance, but they might actually be implementing activities that are not the right fit for, for them. Um, so um, there should be kind of a rethink in the way uh, we consider what are the conditions to access, access this affordable flood insurance, especially for communities that in general um, cannot afford uh, to access to flood, uh, have access to flood insurance. And then finally, um, um, the need to pay a little bit more attention into how we design 
um, the, the processes to access things like uh, flood insurance payments, um, both in the sense of um, trying to help communities overcome some of the previous barriers that they had to access these uh, payments, uh, but also to avoid um, information asymmetries that may be um, leading to uh, a, the wrong distribution of resources. For instance, um, following this work we've done uh, in interviews with communities and we found uh, instances in richer communities where some of the constituents were actually uh, kind of gaming the system to whenever there was a flood, uh, you know, uh, make their backyard, like renew the appearance of their backyard or things like that. And, and so um, this might, uh, you know, be provoking um, a, a, an unintended consequences or unintended uh, unequal outcomes. Um, so yeah, there is many more. And if you're interested in anything in particular, I'm happy to discuss uh, more about it. And, but yeah, and also very, very welcoming. Um, I welcome um, what would be the kind of other legal questions that, that we may have when, when we have access to this type of, I guess, numbers or, um, or um, uh, trends. So, so yeah, really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to see if anyone has a really urgent question for Lydia after that presentation. Otherwise, I think we'll move on to Cyril and then have a discussion section at the end. But does anyone have anything that they're desperate to get off their chest or that they need to clarify before we move on? Pausing, all right, that looks all good. Um, so then it is now my pleasure to introduce Cyril Vallée. Um, he is a PhD candidate at the University of Geneva and Lyon, and he brings a really interesting background into this conversation. So he's been working for more than 16 years as an engineer and institutional expert across the water sector in low and middle income countries, and his PhD is now looking at the legal rights of rivers. Um, in particular today, he's going to be talking about setting up the agenda for the recognition of the legal personhood of a transboundary river using the example of the Rhone. Over to you, Cyril. Thank you, Erin. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so indeed, my presentation will be about uh, the um, power relation between the actors to set the agenda related to the river legal personhood. So I will skip actually this slide, which was a way to present myself. So about the plan, plan of uh, my presentation, mm -hmm. so we'll have a um, few words about um, the Rhone River itself, going back to some theoretical background and after discussing about the Rhone River itself. So I have to do twice at the same time. So just for those which are not very confident, um, about the situation of Europe. So you can see here on the map, uh, so the same, you, you have France and Switzerland. So here is the river basin of the Rhone River, which is the one that I'm studying right now. Uh, you have it here a little more detail with, with the, uh, the fact that, so you have the Alps here and you have here at the, border between uh, Switzerland and France, you have the Lake of Geneva. And you can see, so the Rhone River, which I study, is initially in Switzerland and after cross the border and go back to France up to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so you have the, the length of the river here. What I will add, <laughs> It's um, about the use of this river. It has uh, several different uses, which are mainly hydroelectricity, nuclear power plant, transport, drinking water, and tourism activities. About the governance itself on the Rhone River. So it's a long time established governance. Uh, which go, can be characterized over three main periods. The first one is the Rhone as a production tool, so up to the 1970s. 
So uh, during about one century, we have seen the development of uh, hydroelectricity power plants, the fact the construction of dikes, so the Rhone River could be used as a transportation way. And also the river itself was used partially as a sewage, so you had the industrial uh, um, industries, they were producing directly and the sewage was going to the river itself. Uh, starting of uh, 1970s, so it's the energy crisis in Europe, and we had uh, the end of the hydropower monopoly, mainly by uh, the development of the nuclear power plants. So you might know that the south part of France is considered as a, one of the most uh, nuclear sites of the world. So you have so many nuclear power plants that it's uh, highly concentrated here. And uh, starting after in the year 2000, we have the emergence of complex rivalries. Mainly, I would say people were questioning a little bit uh, the use of the river, trying to have a, a better environment, and also you have all the development of tourist activities. So just for here, it's a few examples. For example, in Lyon, so it's my hometown. So up to the year 2000, you have on the bank, so it's a way to park uh, the cars and to go uh, downtown to do shopping. And of course, now they have re-managed everything uh, as a huge park. So that was in 2005. And now when we speak about the new uses of the water, people are asking, well, we want to go swimming in the own uh, itself. So we can see that now we can the new use of the water. People want to go swimming, especially when I think today or yesterday it was 40 degrees in the north itself. So we see that there is this development of new uses along the river. On this slide, I will maybe not go too much in details, but it just to explain that because it is a transboundary river, uh, we have a lot of different um, actors which are involved in kind of governance. So we call it as a polycentric governance with low coordination, different actors and low coordination only on very specific subjects, which will be mainly, for example, uh, for sediment transportation. When at uh, downstream Geneva, in one of the dams, they want to release the different sediments. So they, there is some coordination at this time, which appears, or sometimes for flood, uh, when there is not enough water or too much water, so it can go through the, the different dams. Um, what is interesting also in these slides, it's the fact that there is different scales of decision. So uh, you can see that we have uh, some of the Swiss actors, such as uh, the district of Valle, Vaux and Geneva. So that's a local decision level, but they are in contact with the Swiss Confederation, with the environmental um, administration and the energetic um, administration. We have so here SFMC and SIG are uh, Swiss and uh, this one is Swiss and this one is both Swiss and French entities and they manage dams. And here after you have the main um, actors on the Rhone River on the French side. This one has a concession for since 1920s about the dam management and EDF is a nuclear power plant manager. And of course, so they are regulated or they have some contract with the state uh, and the national government of France. <laughs> What we can conclude from here, it's a kind of very democratic, uh, technocratic sorry, approach on the way the river is managed. And uh, with 
low involvement of the states and the fact that there is no uh, international water agency. We have a water agency or a commission, let's say, only on the lake itself, which is indeed transboundary, but, but it does not take a decision about the whole uh, river basin. And in France, we have a water agency, but there is no, of course, uh, power decision making uh, on the Swiss uh, territory. This situation is so challenged progressively, as uh, I have explained, for example, with the people who wanted to go uh, swimming in the Rhone itself. And we see that there is new actors with new ideas. Uh, first one is, for example, Appel du Rhone, which is an online petition for uh, recognizing the legal personhood of the Rhone itself. We have uh, an association which has set up a citizen popular assembly of the Rhone. And this association wants to promote also a different uses of the river. We have so this international commission of the lake, which also sometimes um, supports the legal personhood. And we have uh, political support, new political support. I mean, the Green parties, for example, have won several elections locally. And finally, we have, of course, uh, uh, long-term pollutant and the climate change effects, which push also to question a little bit the way the Rhone is uh, managed. On these slides, that was just to present the two new actors, so which is IDEO. That is the uh, NGO, environmental NGO, which is promoting the legal personhood of the river. And they set up so the citizen assembly on the Rhone River itself, which I will come back a little bit later. So that was for the situation as it is today on the Rhone. If we move a little bit on some theoretical background and three main axes that will help to understand what is going on on the district. We have first the theory of institutional economy. And basically, this uh, theory helps us to discuss about the rules, how are they established by them and why, and how do we play with them. So basically, is the fact that who is allowed to express uh, their ideas, how these people are allowed to express them, either by election or by uh, public consultation or by other way. For example, in France, only certain environmental NGOs are allowed to uh, sue on the name of uh, uh, an ecosystem. So they have to be registered and authorized to be registered. So, so through this system, the state has a say on the way NGOs can have some legitimacy. We can study also this evolution of the governance and the different powers about uh, from the theory, territory perspective and the democracy perspective. So on the ter territorial scale, there's a lot of different scales that we could discuss, but I will just name two of them. First is the political scale. So we have seen that there is different actors at very local level, but also at the river level itself, the river basin level, the national level. And in Europe, you have the European level also, which does not apply to the Swiss because Swiss is not part of the European Union. But in Switzerland, there is different also uh, level at the very district level up to uh, the federation level. We could also consider the geographical scale, for example. So when we speak about the river and we want to give the legal personhood to the river, the question is, what is the river? Do we speak about the waters that we see? Do we sp speak about the groundwater that we don't see, but it's here also and it's usually part of the river? Do we speak about the small streams that uh, bring water to the main river, which is the name uh, of the Rhone River. So we see that there is a lot of uh, different scale on geographical scale also. 
there is so this question of legitimacy as um, how do do we express ourselves and uh, mainly i will say in this democratic uh, crisis more or less it's so how do we uh, make new ideas uh, to be approved uh, and maybe endorsed by political uh, representatives and this is the question for example of this ngo so they have they promote the idea of the legal personhood of the own river but who do they represent actually uh, it's the association ideo is led by one people so this uh, person was not elected how come he can decide to speak on the name of the full population of the river basin do we agree on that and how can he manage to be heard actually by his, uh, our political representative and of course there's all this uh, again uh, scale of uh, legitimacy so you can have it locally uh, on your hometown but it's not the same legitimacy that you have at the european level so how can we build uh, or how can the legitimacy will be built and the last uh, axis of analysis is about uh, the discourses so the fact that any discourses is um, a social practice and it makes sense of the reality. So the way the different actors will present an issue, they frame at the same time some solution, um, and they avoid, of course, to discuss about other problems. So uh, that's the way, it's a way to reflect the power between actors on the subjects themselves that they decide to discuss or not. Using these three axes will be part of my uh, PhD uh, in order to analyze the ongoing evolution of the governance and how the legal personhood can be implemented on the uh, river. And here I will give you some ideas so about the agenda setting. So the way that this uh, legal person ideas is progressively moved on the political agenda and can after be uh, implemented. Uh, so first, it's ID, IDEO strategy, so that is the environmental NGO. We have seen that there is an online petition that everyone can sign uh, in order to promote the legal personhood. So it has been signed, for example, from, uh, from Lyon, so my hometown. Uh, they try to have a democratic background, so through this Assemblée Populaire du Rhône, so this citizen assembly, the model which is used is the one that was used by the French uh, president about climate change. So they went through the statistical um, institute to select 30 people on the French uh, and Swiss river district. And these people are trained about water issues and river issues. And uh, at the end, in about one year and a half, uh, this assembly will give some remarks, comments, uh, recommendation, orientation, we don't know exactly, about how the river uh, should be managed. So this idea is a way of saying, okay, it's not only my ideas, but they come from people that didn't know anything about water. They are representative on a statistical basis of the population, and here are their results, their recommendations. And of course, as I said, after there is two other ways. So the fact that there is some connection with the Green Party and the development of nectar of actors behind the administration. So going on different uh, discussions and different uh, forums. about another actors so it is the international commission for the protection of the lake of geneva i haven't really presented this commission so it's a commission where you have the swiss district and you have also uh, two uh, french departments so you have all let's say the district territories which are neighboring the lake geneva either from the french side or the swiss side 
they are supposed to be in charge only about uh, quality of the lake, but they have developed uh, an action plan up to 2030. And the elaboration of this action plan was made with the civil society. Um, some of the actions, so there was different uh, meetings around the lake, but also they took on board the different um, members of the civil society in order to discuss about the lake itself. So we see that it was a uh, original way to have a meeting in order to discuss about the lake. And at the end of this action plan, the first action came that was to explore the ability to give the lake a legal personhood, which is a very strong action, uh, even if it is only to explore the ability, but we see that there is uh, the expression legal personhood and it has been endorsed by both the French government and the Swiss government. And now there is a, a kind of passive mode, let's say. So the commission is not pushing so much on this action and on the idea. They more wait for a policy window, maybe in uh, one or two years when there will be new uh, political representative where they will ask, OK, uh, what have you done on this action? What is the result? And at this time, they hope that there will be a way to move forward quite easily. The last two actors that I will speak about uh, on the agenda sitting are uh, the um, CNR. So it is a company which is in charge of the Rhone River on the French side. And they have a contract agreement with the state, so from the 1920s. Officially, they have no opinion about legal personhood, but the former director supported the idea several times in uh, public meetings. And the water agency, so the same, they have officially no opinion. So that's on the French side also, and the it's a financing agency. Um, and uh, the current director just says that he doesn't see the needs for such uh, evolution. But what is interesting is like both of them, they supported the studies that we are doing right now on the legal personhood. So they are not supporting it, but they want to have arguments, ideas about what means the legal personhood of the Rhone River. And here as a kind of uh, conclusion, so sorry. Um, uh, I, I will insist on the fact that the way uh, the problem is identified by someone um, is the way that the discussion will take now. So we have this NGO that I say, okay, I want legal personhood. So everyone is talking about legal personhood. They haven't bring the idea by saying, oh, the Rhone is not going well. We have this issue on this uh, biological parameter or on this chemical parameter. They just directly say, okay, we want the legal personhood. So uh, that's the way the discussion is framed now. And it is the way that they want to transform an issue to a public problem. So they request the public intervention. And this is very much the uh, three words of naming, blaming, and claiming. Uh -huh. And we will see, so actually, what will be the result of this discussion on the legal personhood? Because of course, you could say, we give the legal personhood, but without any implementation implementation tools, for example. So it means like it's the same as we, if we don't give it. Uh, it depends, of course, who is going to be nominated as guardians, for example. If we nominate only, I don't know, uh, people which have interest in polluting the river, it's totally different than if we name people that have interest to preserve the river. So of course, that will be part of the discussion and it will result of the powers between the different actors. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, that was part of my presentation. 
And just as a final show, and maybe it will be an opening after for the discussion, here you can see two pictures, which are not from me, I have to say, but they are of the same place. I mean, you can see that you have the hotel here, which is the same hotel here. And they both are the Rhone Glacier, which are so the spring of the Rhone River. And you can see here, it was at the beginning of the century, and this one is now. But of course, you don't have the same uh, presentation of the glacier. And that's just an opening. So if we preserve the river, I mean, what do we do with the... Um, the source of the river themselves, I mean, how maybe there will be an extension or is it something totally different? Thank you. Thank you both. Um, that was two really interesting and thought provoking presentations from different perspectives. Um, I'm just going to let everybody online know that if you've got a question, please put it in the chat and we'll try and keep an eye out there for for questions coming through from the, the online listeners. Um, I have a question that I'm quite happy to lead off with, but does anybody else want to jump in? I can see Ishrat raising her hand. One second, I'm just going to bring the um, remote, the microphone. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Lidian, Cyril, welcome again, and really happy to see you again. Uh, really fantastic presentations. I have a question to Cyril. Uh, you know that uh, there is different terms, uh, legal personhood and legal subjecthood. And uh, so far in the literature, I, I, I see that in civil law countries, they specifically use the term legal subjecthood or rights of rivers, not legal personhood. So, so far I know, France and Switzerland are civil law countries. So why do you choose this uh, legal personhood, not rights of river or legal subjecthood? Thank you very much for your question. Um, so I think everyone has understood that I'm not, I'm not a legal scholar. And I will say for me, it's, a little bit, uh, I, I understand the difference between legal subject and legal object, but I have this idea to do this research as a water manager. And to me, I will say, it's not an interest if we speak about legal subject, object, personhood, personality. Just for me, I was wondering, okay, uh, as a water manager, can I have a new tool to protect better my river? And that's in this way that I'm studying it. Um, I don't know if it's answer your question, but uh, <laughs> that's a, a question maybe that I leave for uh, the specialists of the world themselves. And so I also want to add that in Spain, for instance, we have a very recent case, the Mar Menor, that you uh, heard about the other day. And actually um, it is, we talk about legal personhood, the lake has been even given a, a national ID number now. It has an ID card and it's also able to have uh, legal make legal transactions like a company. So I don't know if that you know adds into the mix of the way this, I think this term is still finding its way uh, and its food legally in different places. And we're still even trying to uh, define it uh, either by the courts, either by the law, um, uh, beyond the dichotomy of uh, common law versus civil law, I feel. Those issues um, about the um, just how complex uh, and multifaceted. Uh, uh, the research is and the, the, the nature of the problem itself. Um, but um, nowadays, um, in terms of environmental credentials, uh, all companies um, have to include in their annual report statements of what they're doing. And I'm wondering whether you could um, embed um, advocates um, in companies uh, who could take up that um, mantle uh, and uh, put pressure um, to 
look at that as a strategy. And furthermore, here in Australia, we've had some really key achievements uh, with changes on the um, boards of companies like AGL through activism by very powerful um, key industry leaders like Mike Cannon Brooks, for example, um, who uh, is one of the founders of a major international company, Atlassian, who was responsible for changing um, key people on the board of uh, an energy company uh, to make it more green. So, yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of um, strategy, there seem to be quite a few opportunities. Yes, thank you very much for your question. Um, so uh, uh, I think you're right. I mean, definitely so companies have to be involved on how we protect the environment. And of course, they can uh, be involved on the way they have their management board uh, chosen or elected. That's actually one of the questions maybe for Compagnie Nationale du Rhône, so CNR, which is one of the uh, stakeholders that are presented that have the concession since the 1920s on the French Rhone itself. So they have a board, which I suppose is partially nominated by the state. So of course, on the way the state nominates the board, they will influence in one way or in the other way. Um, but river, at least in France and in Switzerland, are common goods. So they don't belong to any of the companies. They really belong to the states. So I would think that it's not directly the companies that could um, move on the subject, even though they can support it as through their foundation, maybe, or through uh, public events and saying, yes, we want to have the, the river recognized as a legal person. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that there. I think maybe putting pressure back on the state um, like that through supporting that particular endeavour. So you could use that mechanism of, yeah, of mixing up the, the board representatives and potentially when the river does have legal personhood, um, there's an opportunity for the river to be represented itself um, on the board of the companies. But yeah, these are all yeah really exciting future directions. Um, I'm going to go to you next. Um, if we can send that microphone back down, that would be great. Uh, Lydia, you spoke about educating the public as a measure um, and said it had mixed value. Um, and I'm interested um, sometimes... Um, you know, if you inform someone what goes along with that is a uh, expectation of responsibility once someone has information. I just wanted to touch a bit on, um, uh, just maybe dig a bit more in if you had some more information on that question of um, the implications of educating as well as its effectiveness. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for the question. And definitely like this is um, kind of what I was trying to get at and is that, it shouldn't be just a matter of putting out their sessions that are informative. Uh, the format of the sessions uh, will make it so that it's easier or harder for some type of people to access them, but also the way the processes are designed later on, like after the this education is given, will also make it more accessible to a certain type of people to navigate the system or not. So definitely, um, I completely agree that it, in when it comes to climate adaptation and to accessing uh, the resources that you need to recover from an event, it shouldn't be a matter just of uh, dumping the responsibility on the community, but rather uh, we should take charge and responsibility when we design these policies to design processes that can be navigated, but also where communities that need it have the support to access the resources. So for instance, in the case of the community rating system, not only on the individual level, but also the community level, 
you are there's no access to resources to implement these activities that will then give you access to uh, discounts in flood insurance. And even if there were no discounts to flood insurance, um, I think we have to rethink, uh, you know, what are the tools that communities and certain se uh, sectors of society are given to prepare for these events, education and beyond. Uh, and yeah, it should definitely not be dumped on like, oh, you know, if you join in, great, like uh, you get this reward, but, um, but actually making, uh, designing uh, the processes in ways that uh, can help everyone navigate uh, the, the recovery process better. I don't know if that like responds or. Um, all right, I'm gonna use my chair's privilege and ask my question, um, which is to both of you. And I think both of you have presented research on how we can understand the human relationship between rivers and how this might change in the future, depending on the interventions that humans make. So changes to human behavior can start changing both the outcomes for rivers, but also the outcomes for the human relationship with rivers and other water bodies. So maybe could I get both of you to just talk through the implications of your research for the human relationship with rivers? Thank you, uh, Irene, for uh, your question. Um, well, I've been here for a few days now in Australia, and I think we definitely probably have, do not have the main, the same mindset uh, if we can consider, let's say, Australia and Europe. And I would say, at least in Europe, I feel very disconnected, totally disconnected with nature. Um, I, I haven't made research, but I suppose it is due to our Cartesian uh, education, uh, maybe our um, Christian education also, which make us as dominant on nature. So uh, definitely the fact that we promote or we discuss about legal personhood uh, um, and we think about the fact that they have some rights and maybe after, once you have discussed about rights, you also discuss about equality. So that's a way maybe to reconnect ourselves uh, to the nature. And um, my second element will be, I think that at least we will see how this discussion goes in Europe, but it's very good for uh, education and the way of how you manage to uh, mobilize the population about nature itself and how the, we can reconnect ourselves only by this discussion and all this uh, probably democratic also issue. So I think that will be a very good uh, opportunity uh, on this. I'm excited actually by that that evolution or to see that, that evolution in Europe, um, where I'm from too. Um, um, so yeah, thanks for the question, Erin. And I think that um, in terms of this particular piece of research, um, what, what I think um, that can be some, uh, you know, like ways of rethinking what's gonna be the relationship between humans and the river, I think on one hand, um, looking into the way we can evaluate policies that pertain to the river in, in ways that we see who is affected disproportionately or who is ben who is benefiting. And this doesn't have to only include uh, people, I guess, or humans, but also non-human actors um, in the way these uh, some of these methodologies work. Uh, if we have the right data, we might be able to have some insights on that uh, sooner rather than later, hopefully. Uh, but also, one of the things that I, I guess, that I pointed in the in the um, presentation is this uh, connection between uh, impervious surfaces and the way that that makes us less resilient uh, to climate change, but also maybe makes our relationship with the river trickier. Because when when it floods, then it causes more problems. So I think that actually 
that type of finding is probably good news for rivers uh, where we would probably have to have advocate for an expansion of their floodplain uh, areas so that the relationship between the cities and rivers uh, becomes a more peaceful one in a way. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about is, um, so in, in this case, I look into um, a policy approach that encourage the um, in engagement of different or new types of actors that uh, before were not really engaged and given a seat at the table to uh, think about how we decide or what type of activities we implement in floodplain management. And I think that uh, there is an opportunity to go beyond with their rights of nature, rights of rivers to go beyond this first step of engaging uh, the community to also engage rivers um, as living entities in the way we make these decisions and we think about climate adaptation. Um, all right, anybody else want to ask any final questions? All right, well, I think um, I'll draw it to a close. I guess just wanting to um, draw out a couple of the really interesting ideas that I think we've heard from both of the, the conversations today. I think the, the idea of having room for the river and how we create that, whether that's through the regulatory and insurance environment, recognising what works and what doesn't, and, and as you say, in cities, thinking about these bigger challenges of how we make space for the river in an impervious environment and bringing us back into the kind of intimate relationships with the river that people might like to have again. And Cyrilla was really touched by the, the conversation that you began with about the desire for a swimmable river Rhone, um, because we're having the same conversations here in Melbourne at the moment. So the idea of making the Birrarung safe to swim in from source to sea um, is like it's a massive challenge, but people would love that. Um, it's a really exciting and inspiring idea and it, it helps us create a future where we are actually in good relations with rivers. Um, so I think that's, yeah, these are are really lovely themes I think that have come through very strongly today. Thank you everyone for coming along today and please join me in thanking our fantastic speakers.